and welcome to Growing Older with Enthusiasm with our host, Dr. Ron Kaiser. Dr. Ron, how are you? And again, we just keep having these conversations, but the, the whole mission you have of growing older with enthusiasm, such an important thing because we shouldn't look at aging as a death sentence. It should be a time that we're using our wisdom and different things to enjoy our life and be happy, right? Absolutely. It should be a life sentence. And I've been really heartened by how many people have joined the Growing Older with Enthusiasm community. Really great that we can get guests who can provide information that can help them do so. And so who's our guest today? Well, today we have a very special and important guest for our purposes. That's Stephen Moses, who is the president of uh, the Center for Long-Term Care Reform. And uh, I know long-term care is one of those things that we may not want to think about it and too, too many people delay thinking about it. And uh, then it becomes real expensive. And, uh, you know, realistically, I think that it's always better to prevent rather than wait for a crisis to occur. So uh, Stephen's doing some really great work. Welcome to our podcast, Stephen. Looking forward to talking with you. Well, thank you, Ron. And uh, likewise, uh, you really hit the nail on the head pointing out that people tend to uh, ignore long-term care until they need it. That's the essence of the problem. And what we're trying to do is to get people to plan ahead so that they can age with enthusiasm in the best, with the best possible care as they begin to need it. And generally, just so I'm not assuming anything uh, and, and not having the listeners assume anything, when we talk about long-term care, what are we talking about? Is that aging in place, uh, assisted living, nursing homes? What, 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 are, what do we commonly know of as long-term care? All of the above. Really, long-term care in, uh, involves the... Uh, services, both medical and social services that people may need when they can no longer perform uh, critical activities of daily living for themselves uh, without, without help, such as um, transferring, uh, using the toilet, uh, bathing, these basic things that they need help with. Uh, in, are encompassed by uh, the need for long-term care. So it could involve care in the person's own home as well as in a facility. Am I correct? All the research shows that people prefer to get the care they need in their home. Uh, it's the so-called aging in place uh, movement. Uh, the problem is we have our social system for long-term care set up so that it creates a kind of funnel that leads to nursing home care as opposed to home and community-based care, which people prefer. And that's really because uh, this well-intentioned financing program called Medicaid which is really means-tested public assistance, was designed to provide the care people needed, but was oriented to providing nursing home care and has become available to people long after they're young, healthy, and affluent enough to plan privately for long-term care. They have ignored that risk and been enabled to ignore the risk by virtue of the fact that Medicaid pays for the vast majority of long-term catastrophic costs later. So we've created kind of a moral hazard that has directed people into the kinds of care that they would prefer to avoid and could avoid if they only acted earlier in life. Now, Stephen, the, so I'm just interested in the know that why has this is the big reform you want is long term care to be provided in homes more, right? Because they feel more it could be in their it could be in their parent their kids' homes too, but somewhere instead of being in a nursing home where they feel isolated. 
Exactly. We need to recognize why nursing home remains, after all these decades, the primary venue of care for long-term custodial care. And it is that Medicaid has paid mostly for that, and that's what Medicaid pays for. What we need to do is redirect people so that they begin to plan for long-term care when they're still young, healthy, and affluent enough to be able to qualify for private insurance or to have time to save, invest, or insure. There's more than enough money out there in the American economy to fund the kind of care people prefer, but we have to remove the disincentives that operate now in public policy, discouraging people from doing what they need to do when they're still able to do it in order to avoid the dependency on Medicaid later on. Yeah, it's a complicated subject, and I, I would understand if you need to ask a lot of follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. Well, when we talk about disincentives, uh, I think if, if nothing else, I think COVID-19 presented us with the disincentive of, you know, not wanting to really be in a facility with a lot of older immunocompromised people, if you can do that. And, uh, you know, obviously that's, that's a complex thing that involves people taking care of themselves physically and mentally and so on, uh, in addition to being able to ideally age in place. So uh, let's move from the theoretical to the practical. If uh, somebody is sitting there listening, uh, as I said, we always think about prevention as being better than, than crisis. So what's, uh, as an individual, what should somebody be doing to follow the model that you're talking about? Well, as far as prevention goes, uh, you know, eating healthy, exercising, doing all the things that the articles in the media recommend that you to do, that's the best you can do. But according to research, about 70% of us after age 65 are going to develop a fairly severe uh, long-term care need, and 48% will require uh, paid care. In other words, they won't be able to manage just with friends and families helping. So while prevention is wonderful, uh, we need to prepare for the eventuality that uh, long-term care is going to catch up with us at some point. So how do we do that? Well, it's important to recognize that the public programs that have been there paying primarily, such as Medicaid and Medicare, and it's not commonly understood, but also Social Security. Once people are on Medicaid, they have to contribute all of their income to offset Medicaid's cost for their care. So Social Security actually pays about half of what uh, we call out-of-pocket expenses. In other words, it's really important to understand the vulnerability of the public programs, not just Medicaid, but Medicare and Social Security face gigantic unfunded liabilities, something like $35 trillion for Social Security alone. When those programs face insolvency, as they are predicted to do in the next decade or so, uh, it will create a tremendous strain on Medicaid's ability to fund long-term care. So what I would advise people to do is to awaken to the reality that the public funding for long-term care may not be there in the future. So they should look at the alternatives to prepare to be able to pay privately. Long-term care insurance is one option, but it has been uh, fairly challenged because of the competition with the public programs and for other reasons, uh, the costs are very high. Uh, so that's a, a, that is a direction that we might take to understand. But people should also realize that home equity is a gigantic $11 trillion fund that is out there that could go to help people buy the kind of long-term care they prefer, but doesn't now because Medicaid exempts home equity. It's like a, a, a magnet pulling people into it because their home equity is protected uh, at, at a minimum of $636,000 and a maximum in quite a few states of uh, over $955,000. So I'll pause there, but you see what I'm getting at. 
People need to think about the future, not look at the past and how their parents, for example, got long-term care. Because that system may not be there going forward, so they need to research what their options are to pay for long-term care going forward. In so the meantime, I'm working, yeah, I was I'm working on a pay. I'll go, go, see go ahead. No, I was going to ask, you, know, you continue in the meantime, and I'll ha I have a question for you then. Oh, only that I'm working on a paper now that is the second in a series. The first paper has already been published called Long-Term Care, The Problem, and that envisions uh, and discusses the things I've been sharing with you so far. And the next paper that will be out uh, hopefully after the, just shortly after the first of the year will be titled Long-Term Care, The Solution. And it will look at ways to remove the perverse incentives that have discouraged responsible long-term care planning and create new positive incentives that will get people prepared to either purchase insurance or to save or to use their home equity or to draw on the $20 trillion in life insurance benefits that are out there. We need to reconfigure the incentives in the long-term care system to get people prepared to be able to choose but their own care that they prefer instead of relying on whatever the government uh, can afford to and chooses to give them through a welfare program like Medicaid. So, so Stephen, basically what you're sta stating is that planning. So give us some steps of what planning people should do for long-term care and people should be planning it. And again, people listening to my radio show as well, should, and then they're not close to retirement age and different things should start planning for long-term care. Now that's the thing that you're. Yeah, that's, to, you know. that's, that's exactly it. The problem is when people need to be planning, saving, investing, insuring for long-term care, it's the same time of their life in their 40s and 50s when they're dealing with house payments, saving for kids' uh, college education, making car payments, and so on. There's a lot of demand on their time and resources, but we have to set this thing up so that they have a reason to deal with long-term care then, because if you don't deal with it then, uh, obviously you can't buy fire insurance when your house is in flames. So you can't expect to buy long-term care insurance or to have any other means of paying for long-term care if you're already in need of that kind of assistance. So getting people's attention early is critical, but simply educating people as we have for the last 50 years, that if you don't buy long-term care insurance, or if you don't prepare for long-term care, you could lose your life savings later on if you're hit by catastrophic costs. That is not true. It never has been true. And that's why it has never worked to convince people to take personal responsibility. And that brings up the really critical topic of what I call the fallacy of impoverishment. There's a common understanding that Medicaid as a welfare program isn't available to you until you've uh, used up all of your income and assets and fallen into destitution. But most people are aware of this phenomenon of attorneys who artificially impoverish affluent clients, get them on Medicaid, get them in the very best facilities by ensuring they have some private money to pay for a while because the nursing homes are desperate for private payers who pay half again as much as Medicaid pays. So the real problem is that uh, although we've tried to convince people they need long-term care planning, uh, the reality is when they do nothing, they end up able uh, to uh, reconfigure their income and assets and qualify for Medicaid. Actually, Medicaid long-term care financial eligibility rules are very generous. Uh, income is theoretically limited to, to welfare level, but the reality is before determining income eligibility, the state Medicaid agencies deduct your medical and long-term care expenses, which are usually very high for people who need long-term care. Likewise, asset eligibility, you can only have $2,000 in countable assets, but you can have unlimited other assets, including, as I mentioned, uh, home equity, 
up to very high limits. And beyond that, with no uh, uh, dollar limit, you, c you can have a business, including the capital and cash flow. Uh, you can have one automobile of unlimited value, and it's not a transfer of assets, disqualifying to give it away. Uh, you can have, in other words, substantial wealth, including personal belongings, even uh, heirlooms. <laughs> you buy a diamond ring this week and claim it's a family heirloom. It isn't counted for eligibility. So we have kind of set a trap for aging Americans that results in their ending up relying on Medicaid. And if they rely on Medicaid, it's predominantly a nursing home financing system. Mm. Well, I uh, first of all, I, this information is really new to a lot of people, including me. Uh, but the other thing I'd like to advocate for is I know uh, we've had long-term care insurance for, I'd say, at least 30 years when we uh, uh -huh. looked into it when my mother-in-law uh, was likely to need it, which she eventually did. And the costs for us, for my wife and I combined, were so substantially lower uh, than than it would it was at her age when we bought it at our ages. So that even though there have been some recent increases, it's still a pretty affordable insurance. And uh, you know, I think that the reality is a lot of people uh, carried disability insurance, which I've kind of outlived. A lot of people have carried life insurance, term life insurance, which uh, became prohibitive uh, once you reach a certain age. Um, I'd like to also not use my long-term care insurance, but I, I, you know, so I'm trying to stay healthy enough, but, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to know that it's there and so far uh, has been reasonably affordable by getting it at an early age. So I, I, your advice certainly is is very important and appropriate. You know, it's interesting when people do really smart uh, financial planning, estate planning, they buy term life insurance when they're young and it would be a tragedy if their income were lost for their family. It's curious uh, and encouraging, I think, that when you get to be in your early 50s or so and private long-term care insurance is still fairly inexpensive, that's exactly when you're likely to have accumulated an estate and don't really need that term life insurance anymore. So you take the premium for term and use it to buy long-term care insurance uh, and then you're covered for your entire uh, lifespan that way. And as we're learning, as uh, Ron and I had a good friend of ours on, uh, Alan Porter, that there's a lot of different life insurance prop packages that are that are that are the that, that are cash value life insurance and things like that you can utilize reverse mortgages things like that that you can end up using for long term care as well as what you brought up in the if you do have the wealth to do so you can show specific money so that you don't end up in a specific situation where they're taking certain things away from you so there's a lot of things available and having the right planners are involved and Stephen do you partner with a lot of those people in your organization to help uh people who are that um, are dealing with long-term care issues? Well, I have a membership organization and the members uh, include some people in the long-term care service delivery system, uh, but mostly people who are involved in long-term care insurance in one way uh, or another. And they pay an, an annual dues and I publish uh, weekly and bi-weekly material for them. And then uh, I call it the big benefit. And the big benefit is supporting my work to do long-term care research and advocacy on behalf of the idea that we need to get people prepared to be able to pay their own way for long-term care so that they choose uh, the venue and quality and type of care that they prefer instead of being dependent on whatever the government can afford or chooses to pay. Well, Stephen, you've answered a lot of my questions, but I think that there are a couple of things that may have done a, a bit of a disservice about uh, in that we just had you start talking. Uh, you've got quite an impressive background, and uh, 
I know when I uh, when I was going to college, I don't recall any uh, any majors in long term care. Uh, so I, I'm just uh, wondering if you could tell the listeners a little bit about your background in this field, how you got into it, and perhaps finish up with letting us know uh, how people can get, find your work, find you, get in touch with you, and so on. Sure. Well, I uh, was a career U.S. government uh, employee working for the Health and Human Services Department. Back then, it was called HEW, uh, later with the Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services. And I came across this phenomenon that Medicaid was paying for most long-term care after people needed it. And that made me realize that uh, this new product back then that was coming along called private insurance didn't have a prayer as long as people could ignore the risk, avoid the premiums, wait until they got sick, and then turn over the liability to the taxpayers. So I got interested in this. I wrote a paper for the uh, Health and Human Services, and then again for the Inspector General. It got picked up by the Government Accountability Office. Uh, we got most of our recommendations into federal statute uh, in the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993, but I quickly realized that working for the government, I wouldn't be able to go out and say and do the things I needed to do to get the ball over the goal line. So I left government in 1987. Uh, actually 1989, and worked with a company that designed and marketed long-term care insurance. And uh, when they were bought out by uh, General Electric, I concluded that working for GE would be as encumbering as working for the federal government. So I told them, look, you need me doing what I do and saying what I say, but I can't do it working for you. So they helped me along with other insurance carriers to set up the Center for Long-Term Care Reform, uh, whose mission is to ensure quality long-term care for all Americans by getting people to in a position to pay for their own care instead of being dependent on public programs. And that's what I've been doing ever since, including uh, one year uh, full-time traveling around the country in what I called the long-term care consciousness tour in a little 16-foot Airstream trailer told by a silver FJ cruiser and uh, giving speeches and doing media and trying to promote the idea for people to plan ahead. And uh, so that's uh, what I've done and that's what I'm uh, doing yet today. Wow, it's impressive, isn't it, Dr. Ron? Uh, yeah, definitely. And how can people find out more about you and reach you and your materials and so on? Very simple. Uh, our website is www.centerltc.com. My email address is smoses at centerltc.com. Dot com and I enjoy hearing from people. Uh, I think it's evident that this is the passion of my life, and so I'm happy to talk to anybody with a uh, with a question about long term care, any aspect of it. And uh, I can be reached at four two five eight nine one three six four zero. So please don't hesitate. Get in touch. Let's talk it through. Fabulous. I mean, it's just such great information. Last tip for people, I guess we know 50, uh, that this is where you definitely contact your organization and look at specific people that really understand uh, long-term care insurance and planning for long-term care. What steps do you think people need to take specifically enough, especially if they have loved ones they're concerned about that are going to have to see long-term care soon? What tips would you provide them? What would you ask them to do? Because again, we're having an age where there are people in their 60s that are getting ready to, that, that their, their, their parents might be going into a nursing home. They might be going into something that they, they might have been certain. What recommendations do you give them? Well, uh, it's best to plan early. As we mentioned, it gets more expensive the later it gets. The options that you have narrow as you get older. Uh, once people actually need care, 
And as I said, the system kind of channels them towards nursing home dependency on Medicaid. But it should be, people should be aware as early as possible, study this issue, become familiar with it. Do not assume that the protections that have been there publicly financed in the past will be there in the future. And try to focus on how you can be prepared to pay your own way when the time comes. Because as long as you can, your options remain open and the quality of care that you're likely to be able to obtain is much higher. We appreciate it. Great, great information, wasn't it, Dr. Ron? Terrific, terrific. Really learned a lot and appreciate the way that you set it out for us. And uh, again, it, it really dovetails with our philosophy of growing older with enthusiasm. And certainly the more that a person can uh, be in control of their life, even when there are some medical issues, uh, the greater the quality of life and the greater the potential for enthusiasm. So thank you so much for sharing your information with us. All right. Well, we appreciate thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my passion and my ideas on this subject. You're so knowledgeable, Steve, and we appreciate it. Definitely going to have to uh, continue to stay connected. That's the great thing about, uh, you know, connecting with people that have the same like-minded individuals. And I know Dr. Ron and yourself do, and I definitely want to help older adults. And that's why I love working with Dr. Ron. So I appreciate it, guys. That was a great growing older with enthusiasm and also the Neil Haley Show. Take care.